Hi, y'all, and welcome back to By His Grace, For His Glory, our study of the book of Romans. Um, We have studied Romans 1 through 8, and we are about to enter into our study of the second half. But before we did that, I wanted us to pause and really kind of go back through Romans 1 through 8, just to help us remember, because one of the things that um, is really um, can be challenging when you study a long book of scripture like this over a long period of time, that if you don't kind of go back and revisit what you've studied, um, you can sometimes lose. We can get so deep into the into what we're studying that particular week that we can sometimes lose the context. And so um, I want us to um, be able to um, really kind of reset and remember before we jump into the second half of the book. So um, I always start with context. Context is super important because um, we have to remember that the Bible was written for us, but not to us. And so um, it helps us set kind of this frame, um, lens through which we are going to study um, by just answering some very simple questions. So the book of Romans is written by Paul. Some of the things we know about Paul, um, he was originally named Saul. He was a zealous Pharisee. He was a Jewish religious leader. He was trained by one of the most respected rabbis in the Jewish faith, whose name was Gamaliel. Um, He was so zealous that he was killing Christians because of their threat to the Jewish faith. Um, He had a miracle, uh, miraculous meeting on the road to Damascus with Jesus. Um, God changed his name to Paul and he became zealous for Christ. Um, And you can read more about that story in Acts chapter nine. Um, And he began serving God specifically with a call toward um, the Gentiles. He wrote over half of the New Testament, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Um, And what is so unique about him is that even though he is a Jewish religious leader, he was also a Roman citizen by birth. And so that uniquely positions Paul to be able to speak to both sides of the church. And there are multiple um, churches, multiple letters that kind of Paul writes to bring unity to the church. Ephesians is one of those and Romans is one of those. Um, It was probably written in the late 50s AD, probably around 57 AD. Um, And its genre is that it's a letter, it's an epistle. Um, And this is one of those books where knowing what goes on in history is super important. So um, uh, sometime in the uh, about a decade before the book of Romans was written, Emperor Claudius expelled all the Jews from Rome, whether they were Christian or Jewish Jews, they all had to leave Rome. And five years later, after his death, the um, Jewish people were allowed to come back. And so the Jewish believers came back to a predominantly Gentile church and they were clashing. There were two ethnic groups that were clashing over what was required by God to be saved. Um, Things like circumcision, um, eating kosher, Sabbath versus freedom in Christ. Um, And what's really fascinating about the book of Romans is that Paul had never actually been to the church at Rome. Um, He expresses in chapter one his desire to go there, um, but he has not actually visited. Um, There are some key themes within the book of Romans. Um, I already mentioned one of them, unity in Christ. Um, I like to say I think a lot of Romans is bent toward unity in their diversity. So they are diverse church yet they can still be unified um, in Christ. And we see this idea um, really early on in the first couple chapters about how they are common in sin and common in their salvation. Um, And so because of that, um, Paul really is resetting the foundation of what it means to be a Christian. This is the fullest and longest explanation of the gospel, um, which is not only how we are saved, but how we live each day under the gospel of grace. It's broken down into four sections. So we studied the first half where the first two sections, Romans one through four, 
kind of point to our need for a savior versus God's righteousness. Um, the second section, Romans five through eight, kind of talks about how our lives because of the gospel. So because of Jesus, because we're saved, this is the this is what we now live in. And then we're going to pick up um, in Romans chapter nine, nine through 11 is kind of the fulfillment of God's Old Testament prophecies. Um, it's kind of a link to the Old Testament and kind of talking about God creating a new ethnic family um, through the blood of Jesus. And then the final chapters 12 through 16 are really practical advice. What does it look like to function as part of God's unified multi-ethnic family? Um, so I'm going to just kind of go through each chapter very briefly with, um, so part of our study is we write a summary sentence that will help, um, this kind of the overarching, you know, one to two sentences, just the facts of what, um, that passage is about. Um, we focus heavily on the characteristics of God um, because this is a book about him, not about us. And so we can't truly understand what our identity is in Christ or who we are in Christ or who we are, what God says about us if we don't first understand who he is. Um, so Romans chapter one, um, Paul starts with a typical greeting um, and then um, he, as I was studying for this, y'all, I was so fascinated. You know how I just love, this is what I love about Bible study. I've studied Romans one multiple times. I've read it multiple times. And this time I read it and these words just jumped out at me. Um, in chapter Romans one, five, he says, um, we have received grace and apostles, apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations. That idea of the obedience of faith for the sake of his name. That is why this whole book matters. That is why everything that Paul says, that's the, the, the call that we have on our life to walk in his ways and to follow in obedience of what God has. It's for the sake of his name. It's for his glory. And so all of this matters because of that. Um, then uh, verses 16 and 17 are kind of what um, some scholars kind of liken to his thesis statement. This is, the, this is what the whole book is about. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For it is, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So we see this complete overarching, the gospel, it's salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew and the Greek or the Gentile, um, and it is his righteousness revealed through faith, and then we live by faith. That completely sums up all of Romans in two verses. Um, and so then what Paul does for the next two and a half chapters is he really focuses on um, what our lives look like without Christ. Um, and he focuses first kind of on the Gentile side of the church, what, what the Gentiles look like without Christ, and then the Jewish believers. And what's really important, this is why context really matters, is very often when Paul would write a letter, he would um, list off a whole bunch of sins and it would be um, things that were prevalent within that church that he was calling them out on and saying that you need to work on this. That's not what he's doing here in these chapters. He's not necessarily saying this is what the problem is in your church with the Gentiles and this is what the problem is in your church with the Jewish believers. This is him saying, okay, if y'all don't have Christ, this is who you are. And this is what your life looks like, because he's setting this foundation that they are both common in their sin, that they are both sinful and that they both need Jesus. Um, so for the Gentile side, y'all, I think these are some of the saddest verses in scripture for me. Um, and I think it's such a picture of our world today. 
um, verses 18 through 23 of chapter one, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Y'all, without Jesus, we would exchange the creator for the created. Um, his hand is all over creation. He can be clearly um, seen um, I have witnessed this in my own life over the last few months as we have walked. Um, my um, youngest son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes last year. And y'all, the pancreas is an amazing organ. <laughs> and what your pancreas or, and my pancreas does naturally just blows my mind. There is no way that all of that can be regulated by accident. He is so visible everywhere. But they did not honor him or give thanks. And those, I think, were the two kind of key things that help protect us from um, being swayed by the world, from um, wanting to um, worship the creature rather than the creator. Um, we need to remember to keep God in that place in our hearts. Um, and in our lives that in that place of honor, and we need to be thankful. We need to be thankful. And without that, their hearts were darkened. They thought they were wise, but instead they were fools. Um, and they exchanged the glory and the majesty and the power and the steadfast love of God, the truth of God for a lie. Um, so we see in this first chapter, here's kind of the summary. Paul writes a letter to the Roman church, explains the gospel and the righteousness of God, and he shows how people exchange truth for a lie. God gives people over to that which they crave, the created rather than the creator. Um, we see that he is powerful, omnipotent. He is El Shaddai, God Almighty. He is righteous. He is true. He is judge. He is just. He is glory. He is immortal. He's eternal. He's creator. He's sovereign. And he's father. And so then he moves to Romans 2. And I can imagine is there. So these letters were designed to be read um, as a whole. Um, into an assembly of people. So I can imagine at this point, um, the, the Jewish believers might be like, yeah, that's right, that's right. He's like, hold up, I'm not done yet because here is where you were without Christ. Um, and this whole chapter is about breaking down the pride of spiritual um, position. Um, William Barclay in his commentary on this says that the whole of Jewish religion was based on the conviction that the Jews held a special position of privilege and favor in the eyes of God. And so he's saying, yes, because you were Jewish, you were God's chosen people. However, um, Jesus, you still needed Jesus. And the whole of the Old Testament points us to Jesus's coming. Um, verse four and five are kind of some key um, verses from Romans 2, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So he's really kind of saying, listen, God is the only righteous judge. No one else has the ability to judge. Um, and I heard this really great analogy that I just real quick, um, I, um, I think I saw it on Instagram a couple of weeks ago, but it was talking about the difference between judgment and discernment, how judgment is meant toward, um, so earthly judgment is meant toward harm, 
Um, it's meant toward, you know, like, cause nobody ever, you know, when someone's done something like really, really kind, no one is always like, I'm judging you. Um, it, usually when we talk about judgment, it's always because somebody is sinning or, or walking in some sort of failing. And so, um, there's a difference in the art, in the heart and the attitude of judgment and discernment. Discernment says, hey, this is not how God calls us to live. And it meets them with the, the grace to say, listen, I want to help move you toward restoration. I want to help move you toward the heart of Christ. Judgment is like, you messed up and, um, and it has a, an aspect of harshness to it. And so it's important. So he's saying, listen, none of us, we are not capable of judgment. Um, judgment also um, is bent toward an eternal decision. Like I have no ability, nothing in me that can judge whether you should go to heaven or not. That's not my job. It is only God, the righteous judge, who is able to do that. Um, so that's our summary. God is the righteous judge and we are all sinners. Um, we see here that God is patient. He's kind. He's long suffering. He's forbearing. He's sovereign. He's merciful, compassionate. Um, he is the lawgiver. He's powerful, eternal, and faithful. And then we move into chapter three. So the first two and a half chapters, y'all, honestly, pretty depressing. Um, but then we get to verse 21. <laughs> chapter three, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. And we talked about how um, anytime you in scripture, you see that capital law, capital letter law, capital letter prophets. Um, it is referencing what we would call the Old Testament. It's the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and the prophets, um, the major and minor prophets and prophecies that we see in the Old Testament. So he's saying those, the Old Testament testifies um, to this righteousness of God that has been made known through Jesus. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. This is really important. And we see this theme all throughout the book. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Christ Jesus. Um, the NIV application commentary says, rarely does the Bible bring together in so few verses, so many important theological ideas, the righteousness of God, justification, the shift in salvation history, faith, sin, redemption, grace, propitiation, forgiveness, and the justice of God. Here, more than anywhere else in Romans, Paul explains why Christ's coming means good news for needy, sinful people. We are all sinners, but we are justified and redeemed through faith in Jesus Christ. We are common in sin, but praise God, we are common in our salvation. He is Savior. He is just. He is the justifier. He is faithful. He is full of glory. Um, there, there's so many characteristics of God in this one. Um, all right, so now Paul is going to um, to say, okay, I've told you all these things. Now I want to give you an example. Okay, so he's going to use Abraham. Abraham is considered to be the father of the Israelites. Um, you know the old song, the children's song, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. Um, so he's showing, um, he's going to say, listen, I've told you all these things, um, and I'm going to explain to you why. It is uh, by faith that you are saved. Um, and he's kind of anticipating, um, starting in Romans 3, he starts kind of anticipating what some of the arguments might be that people have. And so he kind of has these series of like, oh, well, then what should we say about this? And he goes, no, no, by no means. Um, that's not at all what I'm saying. 
So um, verse 13 in Romans 4, he says, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. So he's saying it doesn't depend on the law. And I'm going to tell you why using Abraham. Now, if you um, missed that one, definitely go back and listen to Romans 4's teaching because I gave an extensive kind of background on Abraham's story and the timeline because we tend to lack the knowledge that the Jewish believers would have had of the Torah. So they would know the Torah, they would know Abraham's story. And so for us, this ver passage often creates confusion because we read things like his faith didn't waver. And we're like, yes, it did. He kind of had a baby with his maidservant, you know, that kind of feels like wavering faith. So here's what's important. Um, he, they, um, he quotes um, in Genesis 15 within the passage um, and says that, um, that uh, he was fully convinced, this is um, 21 and 22, he was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was, and in quotes, counted to him as righteous, so as righteousness. So what we really talked about is that in Genesis 15, Abraham had a pagan upbringing. His father was a pagan priest. And so um, this moment in Genesis 15, God tells him he's going to be the father of many nations. And it says Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. But that is like his salvation moment. Um, and then we talked, it was 24 years later from that moment to when um, to when uh, Isaac was born. And so think about your own journey, like where you were in your faith 24 years ago. Um, and, and know that we all kind of have these bumps along the way and we have places, but that doesn't mean our salvation is gone. Um, and so the same for Abraham, his, he was quote unquote saved by his faith because he believed the Lord. And then he continued on this journey with him throughout that. And so what's important here and what Paul is saying is he was counted righteous before he was circumcised. So he's saying it wasn't him being circumcised that saved him. It was his faith in God. So we are counted righteous by our faith in Jesus Christ, not by our works or by law. Um, God is faithful. He's the justifier, full of grace, steadfast love, merciful, forgiving, life giver, creator, sovereign, way maker, covenant maker, um, covenant keeper, Emmanuel, omnipotent, uh, deliberate, and El Shaddai. Um, all right, so now I'm going to move kind of quicker here because I don't, um, I want us to run, don't want us to run out of time. Um, but Romans 5, y'all, Romans 5 is one of my favorites. And this one has meant a lot to me as I've walked through some seasons of suffering over the last seven years of my life. Um, I am going to read the first eight verses because it's just so good. So remember, this is starting a new section and we see right off the bat, a transitional word, therefore. So because of everything that I that Paul just said, because we are common in sin and common in salvation, because Jesus Christ came and he justified us by faith not by works, not by law. We are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that Suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us for while we were weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps a good person would one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Because of, of that, 
we have peace with God. We are no longer at war with him. Our suffering has purpose. We have the opportunity to rejoice um, in the hope of the glory of God. We get to rejoice in our suffering. Um, and then um, we have the Holy Spirit in us. And because of that, we have his full amount of love poured into our hearts. Um, and then Paul moves to further explain this um, using another example. He's going to use Adam. Um, so uh, with Adam, we were without hope. Adam is kind of a representation of humanity. Um, he um, And then Jesus, this is um, what we call a Christ type in the Old Testament. So this is a imperfect kind of example slash shadow of Jesus um, that we find in the Old Testament. So Jesus, the, the way that we say this is the true and better or the more and better Adam. He's the new Adam. Um, and so there was um, Adam, he kind of talks about how through Adam, all like one man's sin brought sin to everyone. So one man's righteousness brings salvation to everyone. So Adam was sinful, which brought condemnation that leads to death for all. But Jesus was righteous, which made way for grace that leads to life for all. Um, so our summary for Romans 5, we were enemies of God, but now because of Jesus, we have peace. Jesus came while we were enemies so that we could have access to God's grace. And while sin, condemnation, and death came through Adam, righteousness, justification, and life came through Jesus and only by faith in him. He is the justifier, steadfast love. Savior, deliberate, abundant, redeemer, merciful, full of grace, waymaker, um, peace, jealous, Emmanuel, mediator, sufficient, true, and the life giver. Um, as he is kind of wrapping up chapter five, um, he says in verse 20, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And that leads to this ejection moment in Romans 6. Um, so he starts out saying, what then shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? And that overarching theme um, is what we find in Romans 6, that we are dead to sin and alive because of Jesus Christ. Remember, this is about our life because of Jesus. So he's saying, we do not continue in sin just because that means we get more grace. Um, we, uh, and he uses baptism as an example of going under the water as this representation of dying to our old self and being raised to new life in Christ Jesus. Um, and he says in verse eight, now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. Amen. Um, this is, was a great chapter for a chart. Um, so sin <clears throat> makes you an instrument of unrighteousness. Um, you're under the law. It leads to death. Um, impurity, sin leads to more sin. There's no fruit. It brings shame. Um, and the wages what we deserve and what we have worked for. The wages of sin is death. But in Christ, Christ makes us an instrument for righteousness. He allows us to live under grace. We have obedience that leads to righteousness. Um, it leads to sanctification, freedom from sin, fruit, and ultimately the gift of eternal life. This is not something that we earned. It was something freely given. And he closes Romans 6 with this picture of slavery. Um, and again, this is a, this is a good context point 
we cannot um, look through the lens of American history at slavery in scripture because slavery in that day was much different. It was not the inhumane treatment of other people. Um, slavery was often a contract um, for getting out of poverty um, or paying off a debt. Um, there were laws within the Jewish faith that protected um, slaves. Um, and so the a big idea here is that you will obey a master. You will be a slave to something. He's using kind of an imperfect um, earthly example. He's saying you can have obedience to your sinful passions and, and sin is your master and death is your master, or you can be obedient to our holy God. And, um, and this one is one of my favorite names of God, Adonai. He is a good master. He's Lord master. Um, this idea of sin that he, of um, slavery that he talks about is absolute ownership. There's no in-between. You can't just jump from one to the other. Uh, so chapter six summary, sin leads to death, but through Jesus Christ, we have new life. We do not keep sinning because of grace. Rather, we walk in obedience with a cover of righteousness as we are sanctified. We are now slaves to righteousness, not slaves to sin. Sin is a poor master, but God is Adonai. He is a good master. Um, and so then Paul moves into Romans 7, and this is where he really kind of tackles the war within us. And this is really that process of sanctification that kind of he started explaining in chapter 6. It's this idea of becoming more like Christ. Um, but there's a war in our, in our minds and in our hearts and in our actions every day because we live in this already but not yet. Um, we live where we are covered by his righteousness and we are headed for heaven. We are counted righteous. We are under his grace. However, we still live here. And so our sinful flesh continues to wage war. Um, and he has his famous, um, I, uh, for I do not understand my own actions for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to count, to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want to do is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin who dwells within me. And he closes with this wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. It says, listen, I do what I want, don't want to do, and I don't do what I want to do. It is this war within us through this process of sanctification, but praise be to God. And then he jumps right into Romans eight on the heels of I'm wretched and I still sin and I still struggle. He says, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. If God is the righteous judge, he is the only one who has a say. And if he says that we are not condemned, there's no one left to accuse us no one else to condemn us. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For to set, verse six, for to set the mind on the spirit, on the flesh is death, but to set your mind on the spirit is life and peace. The spirit, y'all, the Holy Spirit all of this is dependent on the Holy Spirit inside of us. We can't do any of it on our own. Our sanctification is because of the Holy Spirit. And if you want to know more about the Holy Spirit's um, job, um, John 14 through 17 is a really great passage where Jesus is telling his disciples that um, the Holy Spirit is going to be coming. He talks about how he will um, convict and guide and teach and help us remember um, but because of the spirit, we have life. Um, and he gives this picture of the Holy Spirit interceding on our behalf of Jesus 
interceding before the father on our behalf. And he says, better than that, we are adopted. Remember this theme throughout all of it of this new spiritual family. We are adopted into the family of God because of Christ Jesus. Um, It is no longer by um, our birth um, or our heritage. It is by faith in Jesus alone. We are adopted and we are heirs. Um, And he ends with this. We are more than conquerors. That Greek word is to gain the surpassing victory. Um, This is not a close call, y'all. This is not going into overtime. This is not a nail biter. Jesus has won the surpassing, abundant um, victory. Sin has been utterly decimated. Um, The victory has been won handedly, soundly, and without debate. Jesus Christ is victorious. And we, as his co-heirs, as daughters of God, those who live in his spirit now get to walk in the freedom of God being sanctified as we go. He is our savior. He is sovereign. He is Abba Father. He is one. He is peace. He is life. He is the resurrection and the life. He is victory. He is the glorious grace, truth, trustworthy, faithful, our intercessor, deliberate, our purifier, just, righteous, gracious, and merciful. Amen. That is the overview of Romans 1 through 8 our life without Christ, how we are common in sin and common in salvation, but because of him, the life that we now get to live, the life of peace with God, the life with his life over us, with the Holy Spirit in us, no longer dead, um, no longer, yes, dead in sin, but alive in Jesus Christ. And so next week, we are going to move into Romans 9 through 11. This, um, And Paul is going to continue this idea. He's going to connect back to the Old Testament. There's going to be a lot of stories within um, in these chapters referencing back to Old Testament characters. Um, I highly encourage you to to use your cross references to go back and read those stories in context. We have to remember that we do not carry most of us. I won't say none of us because you might be a Jewish scholar, um, but most of us do not carry the knowledge that they had of the old Testament and of the old Testament um, stories. And so it's really important because when they pick out a verse from the Old Testament and, and quote it in Romans 9, 10, or 11, um, they, it would have also triggered for them the whole story. And so for us, it's really, um, it's a great practice to go back and kind of read those stories. So I encourage you to do that this week as you encounter some of those. Um, God is creating a new family, a new chosen people. Um, y'all, I'm not going to lie. Some of these passages are kind of hard um, and there's a lot of wrestling But here's what I want us to lean into. I want us to continue to keep that lens of what does this tell us about who God is? Because this book um, is such a beautiful picture. It's one of the primary ways that God reveals himself to us is through scripture. And so let's ask that question this week as we move into the second half of Romans. Would y'all pray with me? Father, thank you that you came. Lord, thank you for coming and not just sitting in heaven and waiting for us to get it all together. But Lord, you knew we could not do it on our own. And so you came and did what we could not do. And you died on our behalf. You lived a righteous life and you satisfied the righteous requirement of the law, satisfied the wrath of God and did so on our behalf. And because of that, we now have access. We get to draw near. We get to live and stand in your peace, Lord. Um, And when we do not know what to do, Lord, you are praying for us. You are interceding on our behalf before the Father. So God, we come to you with open hearts, open hands, open ears, open eyes, Lord. We want to see you. We want to know more of you. So just, I pray that as we move into Romans 9 this week, Lord, that you would reveal who you are to us. And it is in your name I pray, amen.